this was I, I visited Arden American um, in Scotland. It's kind of, you've been there yourself. Yes. This great peninsula goes out, you know, and um, I didn't even know it existed for, until uh, Dav mentioned going there. Yeah. And it's just this, as you say, it's a big blob that just sticks out the side of Scotland that people drive past. Yeah, they kind of drive round it, you know. It's yeah. it's, it's like it's like some cities with a bad estate. Everyone drives round <laughs> it, but this but this is absolutely beautiful. It's the, it is the place to be with the camera, and I, I'd, I'd spent some time over there. And um, what one thing about woodland and the, many landscape photographers will say the same thing is that you know it's it's it can be frustrating to make an image of it purely because it's kind of chaotic. There's a whole bunch of trees all doing their own thing and doing what they want to do. Um, which is be, be, being nature. Yeah. Uh, but there's a number of different things that can bring woodland together as a cohesive group, or what looks like a cohesive group in a photograph. And this was one of those situations where I was, I was driving through Ardenmerkin Point, and I'd arrived, well, I'd, I'd kind of arrived at one of the central roads going through it, and I'd looked to me left, and there was this copse of um, Scots pines. Um, but it wasn't the Scots pines um, that stunned me it was the light it was like a milky sunlight corner very directional light late on the afternoon that was coming across from this direction here and hitting the grasses presumably the cops are quite clear it opened open out open. on the left yeah yeah natural scots pine pine copses like that are quite spread out right they're not like you know like you'd expect like all the other conifer pine. Type, yeah. yeah conifer ones are all fighting for the ceiling yeah. as such i mean these are all quite well spread out this is quite naturalist, and um, so what it does is it gives way for. And if there's light, the light can enter the copse and woodland. And um, but I had a, a, a kind of double whammy with this. It was quite good because the light it was milky sunlight entering the copse and woodland, but it was it was hitting these grasses on the on the, on the forest floor, which I've seen before around Scotland a number of different times. And I, but unfortunately, I don't know what they are, what type that they are, but it's basically just like a, one grass type that grows on the forest floor. Yeah. Um, and as the sunlight hits it, these almost become like um, like a source of light in their own right. They're so yeah. reflective, they're so bright. Now, one of the problems with photographing woodland, but two things that I, that I find uh, annoying for me is really big breaks in the trees because you tend to get you know big white spots maybe up in the top here yeah. if there's no foliage, and uh, and it, it distracts the eye straight off the frame. Sky. Yeah, sky. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry, yeah, sky. Nice. So, it, so it would be a big white patch of sky there. Yeah. That wouldn't look right. And and so that's a, 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 a consideration to make when you're making pictures like these. Um, the other thing, really, as well, in woodland, is a really strong shadow and highlight, certainly in light like this. Now, you can see at the front of these trees, there's a few highlights just on the, front, at the edge of the trees there as we're going up. Um, but the shadows at the other far side don't really exist. They're very open, aren't they? Yeah. Very, very open. The reason being is what we've got here at the base of the frame here is almost like like a, this, like a giant like lighting unit. Yeah. And so it's throwing light upwards, and as it does so, it's basically illuminating the shadows on the backs of the trees. And one of the things that fascinated me with this was purely I had to manage the composition in terms of where the trees laid at the edge of the frame. But the thing that fascinated me was this inner glow. On the whole forest, the whole woodland had this kind of inner glow. Everything glowed, but not from just the sunlight on yeah. one side, from the forest floor, from the plantation floor. Uh, and the whole thing glowed upwards. And it made for a fantastic, really quite high-key subject. I've printed this quite large. Yeah. And um, these grasses are kind of on the edge of being bleached out completely. They're not, they're just on the edge. I mean, yeah. once again, I used a two bath um, developer of, of the black and white neg to just retain these. They're just on the very, very edge, but they were white in their but, own But they light. look like the glow because but They of look that. like the glow, yeah. yeah. And so all these patches of uh, white here were individual grasses and you could just see the detail in the individual grasses there. But they were white and they were, they were basically glowing white in this evening sunlight. And, and, it, and what a fantastic place it was to find this and to see it. And believe you me, when you were stood opposite it, even obviously our eyes see things in colour, and when you were stood opposite it, it was quite monochromatic actually, but it kind of glowed. So even without considering using the camera, yeah. it, was a, it, was a, it was a kind of feast for the eyes because you're looking at it thinking, I don't quite understand this because the light's coming from the floor. It doesn't add up. That shouldn't do that in nature. But it was. And I've seen it, I've say, as I say, I've seen these grasses a few times throughout Scotland. 
and they're quite fascinating. Um, but this with this light was a real, real treat. And I want uh, the, the main thing with this is that it was just main the main compositional thing here was just the light, the light yeah. just illuminating from the from the actual floor itself. The woodland was fantastic. There is a one thing in there that I I like that, the, that you get in some woodland shots is this is this path in and I, I love this um yeah this area here where, you, where you've got an opening and, and yeah and it, it's like a little yeah little vignette of its own within the picture it is it, it, it's like these like little gaps and, and to be honest with you setting up the tripod was harder than it looks it was really really sort of boggy and up and down where i was stood and this was at the front edge of the trees they were all kind of linear Straight. Right. They just stopped it because this put this piece of land he was actually farmed. Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, so it was yeah. very, very up and down, but that wasn't touched. And so I walked up and down probably for about fifteen minutes before I put the tripod. Uh, but got the tripod. Um, I put the camera on the tripod to get this kind of arrangement. And even then, when I got back, I still decided to crop the negative, which I don't often. I don't do much of, um, because there was information at the top and information at the bottom that was. Um, I wouldn't say it didn't add anything to the composition. It would have detra detracted from the composition. It would have took yeah. something away from it. Taken the attention So away. it needed to be removed and cut out, and that's exactly what I did. But would you, were you thinking about that at the time when you took it, or was that yeah. a... Yeah. yeah, I knew, because it, because it was a frustration of mine. Because yeah. I was actually setting up the camera. If I went too close... Um, the, the trees on the out on the outer parts, the left and right hand side of the frame, I was losing them. Yeah. And the way the trees lie in the frame was important to so me. It's the way the way it spreads and the, the the leaning in as well. You've got bracketed trees. Yeah, exactly. Leaning in a little bit. On exactly. That. They were leaning in on the edge of the frame there, so I wanted to keep them. And so, by default, because I wanted them at the edge of the frame, if it had a five four. I was going to get too much at the bottom, too much at the top. Yeah. Too much bright at the bottom, and then cluster at the top. A cluster at the top that I didn't yeah. need. And and actually, the extension of the trees at the top were kind of drawing your eye away from what was the most important part of the centre, and so that was a slight crop. And I don't often crop things, but I mean, um, but this was just exactly what I wanted. And the other thing as well, there's just that kind of one artifact there. Yes. Just that one thing, and the beauty about that is, I don't know if we can zoom into that. It um, it kind of glowed. It was absolutely good. You can see the, the, even more detail, the glowing of the, yeah. the woodland floor. Actually, there can we zoom in again on, on that? Just because the, um, yeah. the, the textures within that are fantastic. Yeah, but you can see the whites. And you is can that, see... Is that birch, is it, I think? That's a silver birch, yeah. that, and the, these are Scots yeah. pine there. There's one or two, that's a silver birch there, the dying. The silver birch, I, I think, technically drown in this really wet soil after a while and becomes too wet and they can't survive. But I mean, if you actually, when I was stood there, I was looking at the valley floor like this, the woodland floor, and if you look through it, you can see through the tree, but you can see kind of what my eyes were feasting on when yeah. I was there, and it was a really quite magical, really quite a magical experience actually. Great bit. I actually got it hung on my conservatory wall. I like it that much. Fantastic. I'll look about it afterwards. If yeah, absolutely, yeah. no problem. <laughs> uh, quick question for you on on because you mentioned the developing on that. Yeah. Uh, I never end up geeking. And, this will probably be a longer episode than normal, but we can live with that. Okay. <laughs> um, a lot of people think that the black and white developing, yes, you get lots of different chemicals that can mm -hmm. do it, but you can send your stuff off for developing, and, and it's, it's just really, you know, you get your film back. Mm -hmm. But developing, the way you develop a film can change it dramatically, can't it? You know? Yeah, it's massively different. It's part of it. It's, you know, it's, it's how you develop your film, really, certainly if you're using individual sheets like 5x4, it's something that you can consider when you're out in the field. So when I was taking this particular picture, I knew that to get them subtleties in it, I'd probably use a compensating developer to, to hold back the highlights. And what does a compensating developer do? What it does is, um, most developers, what they do is they kind of, you get your, your film and you pull the developer in, and it, it develops the highlights and the shadows at the same time. That's what it does. And so if your highlights become very, very blocked up in your negative, um, they're very difficult to print. They become too strong. Yeah. And your shadows are, are developed at the same rate. Yeah. A, a two-bath developer, a commentating developer, um, a two, basically the easiest way to describe it, a two-bath developer works in this way. You pour the developer in the tank and it works. It, it, the first part it hits is the part of the negative that's been most exposed, the highlights. And it works on them. Bang. And then what it does is, as as the first path hits the highlights, it becomes very tired. It works very, very hard, becomes tired. What you do then is you throw that out the bath. And so you've got the re residue of the original first bath in your developer tank. Yeah. Then you put in 
the second bath, well, that's the reason why it's called two bath, and that's an accelerant. And what the accelerant does is, the accelerant is attracted to the developer from the first bath that's still got a bit of life into it. And so it goes to it and works hard on it, which is your shadows. Which is the shadows. Which yeah. is the shadows bit. And it looks at the highlights and goes, you're rubbish, you're all exhausted, I don't like you. But it hits the shadows and brings all the shadow detail out. So the, fin the end result is not blocked up highlights because that's been curtailed because you yeah. stop that development early and not thin shadows. You've got highlights that are held back, but you've got shadows that have been worked on. So if you could actually draw a picture and say, I'll just, it's a bit like, it's a bit like making lasso selections in Photoshop, but in the neg in a yeah. tank. But it's like the shadow highlight tool almost in, yeah. in, in a developer. Exactly, that's yeah. it. Um, and, to, and what I generally aim for, and what I use for the reason why I use for that particular image is that I aim for um, a negative that's easy to scan. Even if it looks flat, that's great. All I want is a blank palette, a basic palette with a full tone range from which to work. That's my yeah. benchmark. So a raw file. A, di a, a digital raw file for scanning. A digital raw file for scanning. That's yeah. all I want. And it's it's basically, you know, contained within that piece yeah. of film. And that, that's basically how the developers are. Developers you'd, you'd use a few, couple of different developers for different things as well. You can do, yeah. I mean, you can use um, you can use developers to, to, to like increase contrast. Certain developers will increase contrast, um, and, and and some some developers will. Um, well, it depends on the certain films. There's so many different types. Well, really. which ones do you don't use most? The two <laughs> main developers I use. Uh, well, there's three. There's three. My three favorite developers are um, Ilford Perceptol, which nearly went out of production, but I think it's available again now. Yeah. Which is a fantastic fine grain developer. Um, um, Emafin, Tetanol Emafin, which is a great two bath developer. And also one of my favourites is Precise Alt EF, which is another developer. And there's, there's three basic tools that I can use there. If, if there's one particular film that doesn't need compensation at all, it's perfectly within the tail range and I don't have to control anything, yeah. then Perceptol is a fantastic developer. A great overall developer that will help you out with anything as precise or EF without a doubt. Right. Absolutely fantastic. So why, why, when would you use Perceptol and Precycle? Why, why the two? Just, are, they, are they subtly different? Or? They are subtly different. Perceptol will give you slightly more contrasty negative, yeah. which is less important nowadays because um, I want I, I can in, in, in Introduce any of that in, in Photoshop that I want. Yeah, because you're, you're nearly all hybrid, aren't you? You don't do any. any I part, hardly do any. developing the film, everything's digital. Yeah, everything's digital beyond that stage of this, yeah. And although I still kind of, as much as I can get into dark rooms, because I still love it, yes. um, in terms of uh, commercial viability and business, I mean, yeah, pra practicality. It would be. But, it would be playing if you did it would that be right it would be playing it would be playing yeah unless people start off and be millions of pounds for silver prints i'd, I'd open up a dark room tomorrow yeah. you know, and fun. scanning i mean our, our little camera here is resting on the epson flatbed scanner v750 pro yeah i mean it's 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 been a fantastic piece of kit yeah I mean, it's really really i mean for i'm obviously five four sheet film it's quite a big area to yeah to scan so it, it deals with it quite well in terms of tonality <clears throat> it gives me a good total range yeah it's good so i've got a negative effectively that's um, it's, it wouldn't be the sexiest night to produce in a dark room because yeah. it would actually make a dark room a bit more challenging, a dark room print a bit more challenging. But in terms of scanning, the file that comes in, if you, if you hit your levels and you bring your levels up, it's got from full, on the edge of whites to blacks, so it's got the full tone range. And I've got everything to play with that I want to play with. Mm. So it's perfect. Well, perhaps, perhaps at the end of the article, we'll, you can give me a before and after picture. Yeah. And I'll put it on the. Um, yeah. Put it on the website. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You want to move yeah. to the next picture? Yeah. Okay. Now then, it's this. Um, <clears throat> this was taken. Um, it, I, I just tra travelled from the Kintyre Peninsula, a place not far from Skipness called Clonaig, and I got the little ferry across from Clonaig over to Loch Ranza, which is the. It's the western side of Adam. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Isn't it? the western side of Adam? <laughs> And I just travelled across, and um, once again, really, it was one. Of, it, was, it was maybe one of the moments of time whereby I got out of the car. And I was kind of once again actually leaving Scotland behind. I was heading back, you know. And I'm always kind of a bit glum. And did you go through Arran on the way back? Yeah, it was one of the, uh, from Kintyre Peninsula. Go over to Arran, yeah. uh, Loch Ranza, drive my way around. Normally stop at Corrie Bay and Corrie Beach around there, and then go from Brodick to Ardrossan, and yeah. just. Go get across, yeah. and I'm home quite quickly now, so it saves the big long drive. Um, 
So that's one of the journeys I regularly do. And I just got to the other side of on Aaron. It was a bitterly, bitterly cold day. And I'd had a few hours to play with for the ferry, the return journey on the ferry from the other side. And um, it was very, very, it was, it was blissfully still. It was absolutely still. Mm. And... Um, and I, I often, when I, another thing I, I do is, is I just by habit is when I, I photograph near water, I generally walk into the water. I love standing in water taking pictures. I just love it, you know, even if there's no good reason to, I'll still do it. I just, well, I just love standing in water. It's kind of like feeling the water around your ankles and your Wellington boots. It's great. And um, I walk to the edge. This is, this is what we've got here. This is the Kilbrannan Sound. You can just pick out the the edge of the Kintyre Peninsula, just there, it's just yeah. a and the water was still, it was it was like a mill pond, as people would describe it, and um, the the sky was kind of, it was kind of, um, you know, like a diffused, broken cloud, a little bit grey, very, very soft light. Mm. It's very cold, cold day cloud, isn't it? It is. Cirrus. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah, it was very, very cold day cloud, and the one thing I started to notice is that the subtlety of the cloud um, kind of echoed the subtlety of the water. The water was incredibly subtle. And then what I wanted, when I was stood there, I thought to myself, we've got the subtlety of the movement of the water. And so the composition kind of started coming together. I wanted to see, I wanted people to be aware that there was water here, which was crystal clear. Um, I also wanted people to see the, just the movement of the water there. And then the cloud at the top. And from the cloud came these little shadows on the surface of the water, the vertical shadows there, just cast over the water there. And so everything really came together in front of me. I could see it. And it was, in terms of visualising this, it was quite strange because your mind's telling you there's actually really nothing. You take the picture of there's nothing there. You know, it's just some water. But in terms of black and white... You've got the even colour actually probably would have waited. You've got this kind of just this detail of the foreground and the movement, which you can see because it's blurred. Did you polarise that to cut through the water? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, a polariser yeah. because it was a wide angle lens, it only part polarised, yeah. which worked perfectly well. Yeah. And I knew how to do that, and I, I, because I still wanted these reflections of the clouds, either shadows of clouds coming onto the water. So it was quite well. It was ninety mil um, road and stock lens that I used on the five four. Which kind of polarised that part. So and you're looking see. pretty much straight down at the, at the bottom of that lens, then, aren't you? Yeah, I am, yeah, literally pointing downwards. And I could point the camera down because obviously there's, there's not going to be any distortion yeah. in the distance. I was fine with doing that. So it wasn't kind of drop front, raised back. It was just pointed yeah. down. I got exactly the polarisation effect that I wanted. Um, and just a long enough exposure, about a second, I think it was, just to blur the water and the stones. I wanted that kind of. So you're almost like hovering over the walls. I know you'd think looking at it, it was a very long exposure. But as you look at it, I don't know if we can zoom in and look at some of the texture in the water there. Yeah. Um, but there's some there's some fantastic um, yeah. diffuseness about it. There is if but but with with texture I mean, particularly um, in, around here, there's, there's sort of areas around those rock. Yeah. Um, like a panel beaten almost effect to it. I know. Yeah. It's it's. It is, it is, it is like that. It's kind of um, there's lots of kind of you can see the movements of the water and stuff like that. Like you say, there's there's movements here. You can see how little, how short the exposure was when you start looking at these ripples here. Yes. So you're retaining clear. the ripples there, yeah. And as you look towards the distance, there's and we look towards the distance there. Texture in the waves and there's texture in these little ripples and waves out there. So you can see it's quite a short exposure, mm. but just enough to blur our foreground there. So when you actually, if the viewer experienced the picture, like they, they look through the foreground, they look upwards, they go into, the, they can obviously understand it's water, and you see the horizon, and you start seeing the darker shadows yeah. on, the, on the horizon there. So it's, it, it's a picture of like, you know, four bits, four parts really. You've got the foreground here, you've got the, just the ripples here breaking in. You can understand it's water, you've got the reflections, then you've got the sky. The cloud reflections are fantastic. Now, I mean, you're working on a large format camera there, so there's, yeah. there's a gap between you looking at the ground glass. Yeah. And then you go, it looks right now, and I've got to close the ground glass off, take it off, uncock the lens. Yeah. Or do you visualise those lines as you're looking at it? So you'd sit well, there. I could, I, could actually, I could actually see the lines yeah. when I was looking through the ground glass. Bear in mind, once again, it was an incredibly still day. Yes. It was a very, very still day. So I knew for a fact that not much was going to change when I was there. The only thing that might change is maybe some of these um, clouds might pass by. But generally, what was either side was much the same. So 
it was great. I was like, just take me time. Once again, I was kind of, in a way, reacting to the moment because everything was just so laid back and relaxed. And it, was, and it was so, so quiet. And that's what the pitch is trying to portray. portray. It's just the peace and tranquility of that moment stood there was fantastic. And it doesn't need and I want it doesn't need anything else. And once again, going back to printing, you know, we've discussed printing before about you can't have any automatic rules for black and white printing. This was one of the closest things to almost straight out the can, done, finished. Yeah. Scan negative finished. It was slightly increasing contrast just to bring this out. Other than that, that was it. Top end didn't have to touch it. If I was to put a grad in that sky and start bringing out them clouds, it would look awful it yeah. would ruin that image it's not about that it's about subtlety it's about peace it's about um a quiet moment and you can say i want people to almost say i can just see that water just moving back and forth in the foreground that's obviously swelling but almost an ascendant feel to the top of yeah. it as well as it yeah. happens yeah yeah exactly no but just a, a fab moment a great moment and then i had to head home sad which was terrible.